His educational background is as diverse as his interest. It's in architecture, urban policy, ethics and theology, and he has degrees in both public and private management from Yale College, Yale Divinity School, and Yale School of Organization and Management. Please join me in welcoming David Dotson to Brazosport College. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. And uh, what a pleasure it is to be at such a superb college, at a leader college for achieving the dream, meaning you are a college that has demonstrated uh, significant progress in closing gaps and in spurring student success. What you're doing here is exactly what Achieving the Dream and what MDC, one of the partners in Achieving the Dream, are hoping every community college in America can do. Be a beacon and a model for student success. First, I want to talk with you a bit about what equity means. It is a term that is a lively term of art and a term of central focus in achieving the dream, but it's not an everyday term in current language. So we want to unpack what equity means. We want to understand why the work of practicing equity, that means of closing performance gaps between and among student groups, is so tricky and so difficult and so important. And then we want to begin a conversation about what it means to put equity at the center of a college's efforts and work in achieving the dream. Now, one of the things that achieving the dream always likes to do is to put student voice at the center of the student success effort. So I'd like to invite us now to hear the tale of two students. Kara and Anthony will begin their college careers at the community college this fall semester. They both graduated from high school last spring and they plan to complete their associate's degrees as quickly as they can. I'm Kara. I'm a single mom and I have worked full time since high school. I live with my parents to help them pay rent and bills since they do not speak English and I have low wage jobs. I take public transportation to college and work and I graduated from poor inner city high school. I will need to take several developmental classes before I can even begin taking credit courses. My advisor failed to tell me about financial aid and on top of that, I can't attend the first few days of classes because of my work schedule. I'm Anthony. I've chosen to attend a community college rather than a four year institution because my parents can afford to pay the tuition and I can live with them to help lower costs. I went to a good high school, but when I took the college placement test, I learned that I would have to take a development math class before I would qualify for the required credit-bearing math class. Both Anthony and Kara plan to go to community college. They both have equal access to a community college education. But because of circumstances, some within but many beyond their control, situational factors we might call them, both don't have something that's absolutely critical in American society. Both don't have an equal opportunity to succeed. It's a fundamental American value. We all believe in it probably very strongly. It's in our DNA as a nation to have this concept of the equal opportunity to succeed. Our society believes, and I think most of us are taught this, that everybody should be able to go as far as their talent and drive can take them. So really the message that is commonly understood in America today is this. If you work hard and you play by the rules, you can succeed because the playing field 
is largely level. The environment is benign. That's sort of what we mean when we mean that there's an equal opportunity to succeed. Now the equal opportunity to succeed is rooted in some very strong cultural beliefs. And these are, these are very powerful drivers. They're very important, again, to how we think about ourselves and think about success in America. First driver is something called personal responsibility. And I think all of us subscribe to this. It's an important determining element uh, in the American culture. What does that mean? People control their own destiny regardless of their social position. That really we're free in this society to take and seek economic advantage. And people earn rewards and results in proportion to the effort they invest. So if you work hard, you'll be rewarded. And that's at the core of personal responsibility. We also have this other idea, which is very powerful. It's very strong in the way we think about opportunity. And that's the level playing field. Um, that race and income and gender are no longer the barriers that they once were. And that discrimination and bias reside largely in particular individuals who aren't enlightened, not in the society as a whole. So what that means is our policy environment is largely benign and, and on balance constructive. And I think that probably is a fair statement. Personal responsibility really does matter. We probably have that as a core element in each of the classes that we teach. And the sense is, certainly relative to some other societies, that the level playing field is in fact pretty level and a lot more level than it used to be. So those cultural beliefs are really very, very strong. Still, still, there is a gap between reality, the current reality of deep performance gaps between and among student groups, and the longed for idea, longed for ideal, of a society that really does have this level playing field where people who work hard can move ahead without restriction. So both Anthony and Kara exhibit talent and drive, but Kara, and most of you, fewer of you raised your hands when we said who is more likely to succeed, Kara faces social, economic, and institutional uh, obstacles that aren't of her own making. And those make her path to success steeper and more complicated than Anthony's. And here's the point for achieving the dream. If we look at institutional data as achieving the dream requires, we see that gaps in student achievement between and among groups of students exist. It's inexplicable. We have certain groups of students who do well on aggregate better than others. That can't all be explained away by a lack of student drive. There has to be something else at work. So we have to ask ourselves when we see those differential gaps in performance, and this is core to achieving the dream, to what degree are the gaps that we see between one group of students and another, the result of inadequate individual effort, or do they indicate the presence of a tilted playing field that may have a lot of obstacles and landmines in it? Now, in some cases, there may be a mixture of both. We may have students who aren't yet ready to put the time and effort in. But I think we can probably say the vast majority of our students here are uh, motivated. And so achieving the dream says we need to look beyond the individual student to the presence of factors that might make the playing field less level for some students than for others. We've got to ask ourselves whether persistent and enduring gaps in student performance 
may be the result of policies and practices, many unintentional, that result in an unlevel playing field. And we need to examine particularly our own ways of doing things to see if the inequities are structural. By that I mean whether they're kind of baked into the fabric of how we do things. Structural inequities are policies and practices, many oftentimes unintentional. I really want to underscore that, that result in achievement gaps because of the way institutions and society are organized and operated. In other words, the way we do business may result or contribute to the kinds of barriers that we see. I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm saying that's the structural inequity perspective. We've always got to ask ourselves, why might these barriers persist? We've got a symptom and a cause. We've got these achievement gaps. They're inexplicable. We are all working really hard in this college to close those gaps, but there's something enduring about them. The underlying cause, just like most of an iceberg lies below the surface, may well be structural. Why are structural inequities so hard to remove? When I said they're kind of baked into the way we think, like chocolate into a marble cake, what does that really mean and why? Well, some friends at the Aspen Institute have done really important work on what I call an, the iron triangle of attitudes, images, and policies. And what this essentially says is there's something called, rather grandly, cultural norms and narratives that can influence and shape personal attitudes and biases and behaviors that can get reflected in institutional policies and practices. One of the things about the Iron Triangle is that structural inequities may actually result and originate in forces outside the college. We don't control the images that appear in the media but they can affect the way society thinks about groups and they might seep into our life and ways of thinking. And they may well have, and I would say personally, do have some contribution to the inequities that we see in the data. What can a college do about it? The strategic intervention that Achieving the Dream says can overcome these over time is to practice equity. Equity is at the heart of student success because the equity point of view says that different students have different needs for resources and support precisely because the playing field for them may not be as level as we like to think. And until it is, and I hope each of us in our own way is working to make sure it is level, until it is, we may need to give different students different levels of support so that they can use their talent and drive to move ahead. It means practicing fairness with rigor. And we're going to talk just briefly about what fairness means. It means giving students what they need according to the situation in which they find themselves. And it means maintaining a culture of evidence so that we're always watching to see whether or not we're making progress. Equity does not equal equality. Practicing equity does not mean treating all students identically. Two people come into the emergency room. One suffering a heart attack, the other has a broken foot. I would not treat them equally. I would treat them equitably. In other words, their situation defines the nature of the response. So the emergency room example is really key. When does the situation a student or group of students find themselves in require and justify a treatment for one group that's different from another. 
We can implement policies, practices, and programs that help compensate for inequities that are beyond the college's control, inequities that place certain students at a disadvantage. So we can do compensatory programs. Another key factor which you have here is board and presidential commitment. Begin by making equity a core priority for the governance and leadership of the college. Make it a goal in the strategic plan. Make it a topic for database discussion at trustee and I would say faculty and leadership meetings. And then again, as we said, begin inside. I think it's always so positive to change first what you can but also look outside to see if there are external systems that are impinging and shaping what you do. Examine the data through a structural and equity lens. How much of this might be about the lack of, of talent and drive in our students? How much might be about some of these other factors that inhibit students with talent and drive from making the progress that they can? And then finally, always keep equity as that North Star. It's really our quest and our mission in this work to make sure those achievement gaps, most of which, many of which are the result of playing fields that are pockmarked with landmines, that we figure out ways to close those gaps so that once again, the United States it's closer to the top of that line, and Texas is closer to the top of that line that we saw than the middle or the bottom. We keep that by always having a data-driven dialogue about how are we doing, are we doing well enough, who isn't making progress, and why. We need to invest in professional development, particularly related to understanding and making progress on structural inequities and begin to make equity an institutional success criteria. That we really define success by the progressive reduction of achievement gaps. That really is what we're about here. It's what we're about in Achieving the Dream. It's why the structural inequity lens matters so much. You're making progress. Your students can tell you the things that would help level the playing field for them even more. And I look forward to having a conversation with you about these ideas and about what they mean um, for you and for student success. So thank you very much.